1078, right up 1018. Sir, step back now! Sir, get back now! 16. What's going on, everybody? We are back with another reaction for Death Row Executions. Now, she released this one, I think it was last week there. Uh, we've been a little bit busy, uh, but we're really looking forward to this one. And she actually just brought another one out today, so we'll be checking that out as soon as we possibly can. And if you guys haven't already checked out her channel, we will definitely be dropping the link and a comment and pinning it. All right, guys. So without further ado. Okay. So today we'll be reacting to Death Row Executions, Episode 51, The Downward Spiral, Life of Vietnam Vet Andrew Brannon. That is it. another name that I don't know, but let's see who he is. Okay. See who he was. Yes. All right. Now, if you guys have not seen any of these videos before, uh, a little warning. Sometimes they get a little bit heavy, right? But these are real life stories, so too, okay? There's a lot of history you can learn in this, literally. Absolutely. Okay. So here we go in three, two, one. Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Hello everyone, and welcome to the 51st episode of Death Row Executions. Today's story is on Andrew Brannan, who was the first person executed in 2015 for the murder of Lawrence County Deputy Sheriff Kyle Wayne Dinkeller. That was only five years ago. Oh. Andrew Brannon was born on November 26, 1948, in Georgia. He was the middle child of three boys, and he grew up on a farm where three generations of Brannons had lived. His parents, Esther and Bob, were married and did their best to make sure their children grew up with respect and good morals. When Andrew's father Bob graduated from high school, he joined the National Guard and fought in two wars before retiring in the mid-1960s. He was a war hero and wanted his sons to follow in his footsteps. After retiring from the Army, he went back to college to earn a degree and became a middle school principal. He was very well respected in his community and his wife supported him throughout the years. When Bob was away at war, the three Brannon boys were sent to military schools that were far away from home in the hopes of them growing up to be honorable men in society. Unfortunately, things did not go as planned, and one by one, things started to go downhill for the family. Andrew's eldest brother Bobby dropped out of college in order to fight in the Vietnam War and became a helicopter gunner. He was injured after surviving a crash, received a Purple Heart, and eventually settled down married and had three children. He passed away at the young age of 32 while crashing an aircraft that was just a mile shy of landing. Andrew's younger brother Sam graduated high school but immediately after graduation joined the Vietnam War just like his brothers. By the time the war was over Sam was honorably discharged. He married but his wife soon filed for divorce and his mental health came crashing down. He fell into a deep depression and began to heavily drink. He lost his job, he lost his wife, and felt that he had no control, so he made the decision to end his life at the age of 31 by sitting in a car and succumbing to the exhaust fumes. As for Andrew, he was opposite of his brothers growing Me and Jen were actually uh, talking about that not too long ago. Yeah, we know that there was a lot of people who doing suicides um, at, the, at that time. Mm -hmm. Exhaust, right? Uh, and I think they modified so that you're not able to do it, or at least do it as easily anymore. 
yeah, I know that was, I hate to say that was becoming a really common way to do it, but it, if you look back in history, you'll, you'll see. Yeah. It's really sad. So when three, two, one. Yep, and was more of a shy and reserved type of person. He considered himself to be more of a nerd and not as attractive as his brothers. After graduating high school in 1967, he attended West Georgia College and majored in history. He completed one year of college before deciding to drop out and enlist in the army to fight in the Vietnam War along with his older brother. While fighting, he specialized as an artillery officer and although he had to keep it together and portray to be strong, inside he was struggling because he had witnessed so many people die. One of his friends and fellow officers died near him after stepping on a landmine and his commander was killed as well. He was later sent to LZ Dottie which was a 1st Battalion base for the 6th Infantry. It was Andrew's battalion that had killed over 500 innocent civilians that was compromised of mainly women and children, so they were dubbed baby killers. After that massacre, Andrew wrote letters home to his parents saying that he was not in a good place and that it was very dangerous where he was. At one point, his physical health also declined and he wrote home that he felt that he had dysentery and that they did have a good medic, but the medic was hit by a landmine. He had recounted distinctly being able to recognize the smell of burning flesh, seeing fellow soldiers injured and disfigured from mines or shrapnel, and screaming in pain around him. After seven years in the imagine. Army, yeah. Andrew was sent to the Army Reserves before being honorably discharged in 1975. Like his father, he received awards for his service and received a Bronze Star and two Army Commendation Medals. He had no issues while fighting under horrible conditions and fellow servicemen spoke very highly of him. A year before being discharged, that's when his younger brother Sam deployed to fight in the Vietnam War in 1974. The same year Andrew was discharged from the Army is when his older brother Bobby passed away, but it was also the same year he got married. The relationship was far from perfect and the recent loss of his brother, along with the effects of the war, had changed him and he was suffering from PTSD, which he felt caused him to be abusive and angry with and around his wife. Andrew's wife was not happy, so after mm -hmm. six years of marriage, their divorce was finalized in 1981. Andrew's younger brother had passed away and his father passed away in 1993 from prostate cancer. A year after the death of his father, Andrew was diagnosed with depression and bipolar disorder by the Department of Veterans Affairs, who in turn declared him to be fully disabled. He had been hospitalized twice because of his mental health as well. Four years after his diagnosis, he would still experience flashbacks and his mental health continued to decline because he would go off of his medication. He was living alone in Lawrence County and only had his mother for support. The home was built by Andrew in the woods, far away from others. One day on January 12, 1998, Andrew drove to his mother's house in Stockbridge, Georgia to spend some time with her, and by the time afternoon rolled around, he decided to leave and head back home. He was on Interstate 16 when Deputy Sheriff Kyle Dinkeller saw that Andrew was driving about 98 miles per hour on his radar gun. Not pulling over right away, Andrew exited the freeway onto Whipple Crossing Road in a rural area, and Deputy Kyle, who was equipped with a microphone on his persons, decided to turn on his dash cam. He then stopped approximately 20 feet behind Andrew, and this event occurred. Driver, step back here to me. Come on back here for me. Come on back. How you doing today? Good. Come on back here. Keep your hands out of your pocket. Keep your hands out of your pocket, sir. Sir. Come here. Sir, come here. 37 radio 1078. Come here, sir. Sir, get back. Who are you calling, Sir, get back. Now, get back! 
Get back. Sir, get back now. No. Get back. Fuck you. Sir, get back. No. I'm telling you now. Get back, sir. Sir, get back. Sir, step back! Sir, step back! And I am not sir, fuck you! Sir, step back now! Get back! Get back! Get back now! 778 way up 1018! Sir, step back now! Sir, get back now! 16! Sir, get back! Get out of the car now! Sir, get out of the car! I am doing my life. Get back here now. Get to your vehicle. Put the gun down. Well, I got me out the gun. I need help. Put the gun down. Put it down now. Put the gun down. Drop the gun now. Due to the sounds and the graphic nature of the video, I was not able to show the whole video, but you will be able to find it if you search on YouTube. From that encounter, Deputy Kyle was only able to shoot Andrew once in the stomach, and Andrew was able to shoot Deputy Kyle nine times. Most of the shots were in his arms and legs, and the fatal shot was to Deputy Kyle's eye, and it came after Andrew was aware that Deputy Kyle was unconscious. Initially. When Deputy Kyle fired, they were warning shots, so by the time he was in danger and needed to shoot Andrew to protect himself, he had to reload, which cost him the necessary time that he needed. Andrew eventually fled the scene, and when cops got a warrant to search his home, he wasn't there because he was hiding in the woods. They did, however, find two rifles hanging on his wall, with one being the murder weapon. Next to his house was Andrew's white truck that had bullet holes in it, and was later seized for evidence. Along with the gun and car that was used during the incident, police also found bloodstains, ammunition, shell casings, and weed. Andrew was soon arrested, and he was indicted on malice murder on April 7, 1998. The state of Georgia then filed a motion that they would be seeking the death penalty on April 30, 1998. The actual trial began on January 18, and ended on January 30, 2000. The jury found Andrew guilty of malice murder, and he was sentenced to death by method of lethal injection. Andrew tried to file for a new trial, but it was denied on July 2, 2001. His appeals were also denied, with one point being that his truck was not able to be inspected because the towing company that took his car gave it to the lien holder and it was eventually repaired and sold to somebody else. In the document's own words, it stated that he had filed a motion to preserve, inspect, and examine all of the evidence related to the crime before the trial, but his wishes were not granted. Other points made was that the court was not made aware that he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and PTSD, and that he was declared 100% disabled. His time in war and effects of the war were also not talked about. While being able to take medication in prison, his mental health did get better, but he was caught with a handmade razor weapon, so they said that his violent behavior had not changed. The efforts to get Andrew's death sentence commuted failed because the Georgia Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court failed to intervene. After 17 years on death row, Andrew was set to be executed on January 13, 2015. He was being held at the Georgia Diagnostic and Classification State Prison and for his last meal, he had three eggs over easy, biscuits and gravy, sausage, hash browns, pecan waffles with strawberries, milk, apple juice, and decaf coffee. For his final words, he said, I extend my condolences to the Dinkeller family, especially Kyle's parents and his wife and his two children. I feel like my status was slow torture for the last 15 years. I had to say that with them here. I have to tell the truth. I am certainly glad to be leaving. He then prayed with a pastor and was pronounced dead at 8.33 p.m. Deputy Sheriff Kyle was married to his wife Angela and they had two children together with one on the way before his death. Their son was born eight months after Kyle passed away. Thank you for watching and now for
Thank you for watching and now for discussion and question time. Being that there's actual video evidence of the actual crime and there's no argument as to whether or not he's the killer, do you think that it was smart for the attorneys to try and argue anything about the evidence, for example, like them not being able to examine the car? I don't think that's relevant. If they're trying to get his sentence commuted to life in prison, I think the smartest thing to do would be to focus on the fact that he's now on medication and um, how they did not present anything in court about his PTSD or his bipolar disorder. So I agree. Me too. I, uh, you know, um, I started thinking about more and more as the video continued on. And I mean, his reaction to the police officer, I mean, well, what was going on in his head must have been totally different, totally different. Right. I, I mean, he was probably having flashbacks. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's just hard, you know, I, I've never, I can't put myself in that situation. I can think about it. But without having experienced it, you know what I mean? It's it's just it's just unfortunate that the mind can deteriorate like that, um, and that people end up having these horrible flashbacks after these events. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and obviously, that's a common thing in war. But I guess. It's also a common thing with a lot of stuff too, you know what I mean? Um, and a lot of dark topics, you know what I mean? To have PSD about a lot of bad things that have happened to you or that you've done in the past mm -hmm. and stuff, you know what I mean? Um, it can haunt a person's soul, you know what I mean? And this is a perfect example right here of what it could do to a person. Absolutely. You know I mean? It's a perfect example right there. And, you know, somebody who was so respectable is now face to face with a cop and, you know, the way that he probably would have reacted given like a couple of years ago would have been way different compared to how yeah. he reacted in this. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's insane. Um, maybe that's not the right word to use, but <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's continue this three, two, one. So let me know what you guys think. What are your thoughts on Deputy Kyle emptying his clip off in the air before aiming at Andrew? He had to reload before he even tried to aim at Andrew. And in the video, he had yelled that he was in fear of his life while instructing him to put down the gun. I have watched other speeding stops from this officer and he had allowed suspects to walk behind him freely and did not seem cautious at all. He absolutely did not deserve to die, but it did make me think of how some people are shot and killed while they have absolutely no weapon on them. But someone like Andrew, who was clearly not all the way there mentally that day, was able to run up to Deputy Kyle, cuss him out, run back to his car, shout more obscenities while holding his rifle, and was able to get shots out. And even with those shots, Deputy Kyle still did not shoot at Andrew. They were warning shots. Why do you think that is? Before I go, I would like to give a shout out to Michael, Shannon, and Candace. Thank you so much for becoming patrons on my Patreon. What do you, why do you think that? I don't know. Yeah, that raises some good, a good question. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> yeah. It's a question that makes me think about it. Absolutely. You get some pretty crazy stories here. here. <laughs> sure do. <laughs> Sucks me into it a little too much there. Oh, um, yeah. Okay, guys. Make sure you definitely go over and check out Air's channel. Death Row Executions. And as you can tell, the videos are exactly what the channel name is. Absolutely, 100%. 100%. <laughs> okay, guys, next time. Keep it spooky. Keep it spooky.